All right, I'm here today with Melinda Tankard Reist. Is that right? That's it. All right, I'm really, I'm really happy uh, to be talking, Melinda. Thank you so much. I feel very uh, privileged to speak uh, to someone uh, like yourself. I'm just going to let the uh, viewers and listeners, while I get my reading glasses on, let them know who you are in case they're not familiar with your work. So, of course, your website at www.melindatankardreist.com. Melinda is an author, speaker, media commentator, blogger, and advocate for women and girls. She's best known for her work addressing sexualization, objectification, the harms of pornography, sexual exploitation, trafficking, and violence against women. Melinda is the author or editor of six books, including Getting Real, Challenging the Sexualization of Girls, Big Porn Incorporated, Exposing the Harms of Global Pornography Industry, and Prostitution Narratives, Stories of Survival in the Sex Trade. An opinion writer, Melinda has appeared on ABC's Q&A and the Gruen Sessions, as well as many other TV and radio programs. Melinda is co-founder and movement director of the grassroots campaigning movement collective Shout for a Free World of Sexploitation, exposing corporations, advertisers, and marketers who objectify women and sexualize girls to sell products and services. An ambassador for World Vision Australia, Compassion Australia, Hagar New Zealand, and the youth mentoring body, the Rays Foundation, Melinda is also senior lecturer in the Center for Culture and Ethics at Notre Dame University in Sydney. Melinda is named in Who's Who of Australian Women and the World's World Who's Who of Women. Wow, quite the resume. So thank, thank you. you again for doing this. And I just want to mention the book that um, uh, Big Porn Incorporated for the viewers. This is what it looks like. And I have to say, this is, um, I just pulled this off the shelf again, and this is an incredible body of work um, for some real heavyweight academics based on some really, really solid research. And it goes through, um, uh, the first part is about pornography cultures, um, uh, sexualization of childhood, rape culture, peer-to-peer -peer porn, um, other uh, other chapters. The second one talks about the industry itself. Uh, chapter three is dedicated to the harm of children. Part four, porn in the state. And part five is called Resisting Big Porn Incorporated. So I really recommend uh, that this was a real eye opener and a game changer for me in understanding uh, the big picture about porn. So I really recommend uh, everyone check out Melinda's website and buy this book and read it please okay so melinda i'm interested in discussing um your experience as a mostly as a you wear a lot of hats and, and i'm i want to focus today on your experience as a speaker and an educator and uh talk about um how the what i call in my talks i call this the unprecedented situation of our culture and it's this, never before in the history of the human race have so many people had so much access to so much hardcore sexual material. Yes. And, and to say this has never existed in the history of the world is, is a fact. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean? So I'm interested, Melinda, in your stories and your experience and your professional um, take on mm -hmm. how access to porn is affecting youth. Um, what's going on with teenagers in terms of uh, sexting, texting, using apps like Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram? What's revenge porn? What's sextortion? Like, I mean, some of these words didn't even exist. Like, sexting didn't even exist 10 years ago or mm -hmm. sextortion. I actually just came across that one this week. Uh, the sexualized forms of communication among teens and youth, the pressures they're facing, um, and how porn has shaped their expectations and understanding of sex. So I know I just threw a lot at you, but, and, and I, but I know you can you know, do this in your sleep because you, know, you have so much experience with this. So 
Melinda, let's let's just give me an idea of um, how many how many talks have you actually done over the years? I haven't got an exact count, Paul, but I would say in the last decade I've addressed thousands of young people uh, around Australia and some overseas as well. And in that time, I've seen this issue uh, get worse. I've seen the exposure get worse. I've seen even younger children now uh, talking about their exposure to uh, pornography. I believe we're engaging in a never-before-seen experiment on the healthy sexual development of our young people. Mm. And uh, we have to recognise this if we're going to help our young people aspire to healthy, respect-based, intimate relationships in the future because right now uh, the sex education they're receiving from porn is not going to help them to achieve that, in fact, quite the opposite. Okay, so uh, that's great. I want to come back to that. So uh, when a school brings you in and... And it's middle, um, it's middle school in Australia, so that would be like uh, our grade six, seven, eight, I think. And then it would be high school, 10, 9 to 12? Yeah, roughly that, yes. But I'm also even doing primary now. So what we would call grades fives and six, the last two years of primary school before young people go to, to secondary school. Okay. Which is deeply disturbing to me that I have to address them so young. The, yeah, well, the more you get into this, the more yeah. disturbing it, it can become for sure. Um, so w- when a school asks you to come, what's the message that they want you to bring? Like, why are they bringing you in? And is it, I, I've seen, and, and uh, viewers can watch Melinda's talk on YouTube. Um, it, it seems like they pack out the auditorium for you. And, and <laughs> they're all, all the kids in those grades are there to just hear you speak for, what, a yeah. couple hours? Yeah, yes, I'm very grateful for those opportunities that uh, schools give me, Paul. What, what the schools are wanting me to do is to help their students to navigate a sexed-up world, to navigate a hypersexualized landscape. Let's face it, they're growing up in, in porn land. They're, they're growing up in porn culture and that is shaping their attitudes and that's then shaping their behaviours. And schools are seeing the impact on this, as are parents, as, as, as is anyone who's alive and chooses to recognise what's going on. So they're wanting me to help unpack what I call porn culture, porn culture. help young people see uh, the impacts of that culture on them uh, also to bring in uh, global research on the subject. So this is not just my opinion. The global research testifies now to uh, the detrimental impacts on porn in terms of distorting uh, ideas about sexuality, uh, warping developing sexual templates at a very critical time in a child's development. And then uh, they especially want me to empower young people to uh, resist porn scripts to re- to resist uh, the dictates of the porn industry about what sexuality is, mm. and to see that this is actually a form of indoctrination. Uh, it's a form of propaganda, and you're not going to learn about healthy sexuality. You're not going to have healthy sexual relationships when uh, pornography is your uh, formative a primary tragically sex educator because it gives a hollow understanding of a sexuality and true intimacy and the the themes are increasingly around domination and submission and coercion and the reinforcement of rape myths and the reinforcement of racist tropes some of the the worst content i've seen as related to the treatment of black women and uh, Jewish women, for example, and we've we've examined all of that in a global campaign against Pornhub. Right. And so that's what the schools want me to do, you know, wh- why it's harmful to you and what you can do about it. And especially for girls, how they can 
be empowered to say no. Like a common response mm. after my talks to girls is mm -hmm. uh, we're allowed to say no and not feel bad about it. Some yep. girls have said to me, we didn't even know we were allowed to say no, which is an absolute really? tragedy. Like, where are the parents? You know, like, I don't know, maybe we just took a big tangent here, but I, I'm like, <laughs> what, what, how, what kid just grows up and gets to the age that you meet them? And Melinda is the first adult that tells them they don't, they can say no. Like, I'm just shaking my head going, where did we fail her? That's an absolute tragedy. Look, I think yeah. some parents uh, have found it, it. We can't compete, you know. I've got four children. How do we compete with a global uh, industry, a multi-billion-dollar industry, which is targeting our children with porn, deliberately dropping porn into the feeds, especially of boys, uh -huh. deliberately finding our children? I mean, the porn industry has set up entire pornographic websites based on children's favorite cartoon characters uh you know literally the titles from from yeah. disney characters disney movies and if so you spell it, a name or if you if you misspell a, a, a name by a letter it's very close and it'll take you to a, a porn site that's exactly but, right but yeah. even if you don't misspell even if you search for an innocent search term in a search engine you can end up in a porn site almost straight away Right. So the, the porn industry has colonised our world, colonised culture, colonised the worlds of our young people, and as a result, they think this is how you behave. Boys are being taught a sense of entitlement to the bodies of women and girls. Mm -hmm. Girls are being seen as just porn fantasy props that have to do what they're told, what is demanded mm -hmm. of them, and we're seeing that play out in more coercive control in controlling behaviors in more pressure on girls to engage in sex acts they don't want or like more sexual harassment of girls in schools girls being groped girls having jokes made about their bodies uh, girls being demanded to send sexual images sexual pictures and being punished if they don't and uh, so yes i agree parents have to have an important role to play here but it's very difficult for parents to compete uh, with the, the saturation, the mass social saturation and conditioning by the porn industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to just come back to a, like a phrase you said earlier that I, I found I find very interesting also as a, as a clinician, and it's the idea of the sexual template and, and warping or affecting a child's sexual template. Um, and so can you just expand on that a little bit? And, and if you know of any actual studies on this, I'd love to know. Maybe you can send it to me later because you sure. probably have to check into that. But I, I, this is so important. And, mm. and I'm coming back to this because as a clinician, you know, I deal with a lot of clients that have uh, compulsive sexual behaviors or sex and porn addictions. 85% of them have experienced sexual abuse. And, yes. and there's often a strong correlation between their early sexual experiences and the type of porn they gravitate to or their yes. early sexual experiences and, um, you know, how they, how they, uh, their, their attractions and their interests and certain things that turn them on. Um, so I'd like to hear, you know, just expand, expand on that a little bit if you can. Well, what we've done is we've allowed boys to be aroused by sexual violence. The most common and most popular genres of pornography are the most violent. When, when an adolescent boy whose sexuality is still developing is aroused by and gets turned on by that kind of pornography, he's going to seek that out more and he's going to seek that out in real life partners. Yeah. So what, what girls are telling me is that boys are behaving more callously towards them. They're more, they're more brutal. Um, having brutal. sex is that's about strong, making... That's a strong word, brutal. Like, what well, are you I have so many girls now telling me, high school girls telling me that, quote, unquote, he went for my throat without even asking. He wanted to ejaculate on my face. He wanted to choke me and strangle me. He wanted to pull my hair. These are the signature sex acts in porn. 
Yes, you know, it's all straight that's from where the they're learning it from. I don't right. think a boy automatically thinks I'm going to strangle this girl. Where, where mm. does that idea come from? Yeah, you know, the porn industry is grooming boys to want to do these things and grooming girls to expect that they should have to enjoy it because mm. in porn, you know, women love being violated. Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. no well, means yes. I read a study where uh, in the, the uh, it's about eighty five percent of normal porn, not not even like the fringe stuff. There's mm -hmm. there's uh, shows violent acts of verbal or physical violence against the woman right. from the from the man in ninety percent of the case, and That's it's right. um it, it's a high. The you might it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something like in eighty percent of the instances, the woman's face is neutral or experience pleasure. I think it's even higher than that. Maybe, maybe, okay. Yeah, it's cited in the book you've got there, um, the big oh, okay. porn book. Uh, but certainly, the vast majority of women are shown as taking pleasure in degradation. In degradation. What does that mean for intimate relationships? And um, choking is on the rise, and that's something I've noticed in the last year. The number of young women that tell me about uh, the partner expecting her to want to be strangled and choked. Now, this is, of course, not just from, uh, from porn directly, but it's also from uh, porn-themed uh, movies, uh, for example, Fifty Shades of Grey and now uh, 365 Days, which is the new one. It's sort of an offshoot of yeah. Fifty Shades. And it just normalises uh, coercion and, and domination and control of women you know everything we've been fighting against for years decades the women's movement has now been sold to us as as empowering and as liberating yeah yeah it's, it's and like it's women like and a, girls are expected to cooperate in this yeah it's like um it's like a bunch of guys uh, it's like all the ceos of the porn companies got together in a room and said okay let's list all of the progress women have made in terms of uh, asserting their value as, as, as equal uh, human beings, worthy of dignity, et cetera. Let's start right. smashing all of those one by one. That's right. And I think they've succeeded, you know. Yeah. They've, they've embedded new codes of conduct in, in men and boys. They've inhibited men from integrating empathy into their, into their sexuality. Mm. And this is... This is an absolute disaster. We've seen a rise of coerced anal sex, even in younger girls. And I've spoken to girls who have, well, I've spoken to medical practitioners who have treated girls who have ended up with colostomy bags, you know, and I don't know how graphic you want me to be, but this is what our young people have a right to know. The, yeah, you know, don't you hold don't back. Have... That's okay. I, I like. I really yeah. think I, I have trigger warnings on all my presentations. So okay. go for it. Yeah. Well, girls are being injured. They're being injured by these um, violent sexual acts that um, boys expect to be able to perform on on them, and you know it's an absolute tra tragedy for our young people, for their sexuality, for their relationships, and. When a when a boys are saying things to like, I don't get aroused by real by a real woman now. I get aroused to a computer. So they're learning to be aroused by an inanimate object. Uh -huh. And there's research showing that they're losing the ability to to read body language. They're losing uh -huh. face to face communications because everything Ooh. is happening on a screen. They're turned on. They see a computer in a ro in a room. They get turned on. And, you know, this is corrosive to connection. It's destructive of emotional health and well-being. And it's, it's actually making uh, boys who, are lo who may be lonely even, even, more, even more lonely. Mm. So, you know, it, it's, it's just... Um, so it's destroying sex, in other words. Porn is destroying, destroying sex. Destroying sex and destroying love, you know. Mm. Yeah. And it may sound cliché, but... I do believe that, yeah, you know, I do believe that porn feels love. Mm -hmm. And the, a lot of the girls that I speak to say to me, uh, they don't actually expect love, they don't expect uh, romance. Um, having, having sex is uh, certainly not romantic for many of them. And they talk about, you know, being given a, a pounding. I had a, a woman, she was in her early 30s, tell me that 
on dating sites, she puts, uh, she lists wanting to stare slow into someone's eyes and make love slowly. She puts it as a fetish because she says otherwise it won't get considered. It has to be seen as something weird, some kind of crazy kink. Uh, otherwise, otherwise it won't even be considered. Yeah. You know, and this is why, you know, more girls are not even wanting to to have sex and, you know, I, I don't blame them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't blame them. Why, why, why would you want that? It's, yeah. There's nothing appealing or attractive or sensual. There's no sensuality in, in that kind of, of sex. Well, and, and the thing is that, you know, the, the, when you're 15, 16, you have no perspective on life. Like you have no experience, yeah, right. no frame of reference, nothing to, to measure it by. And that's when right. everything that you see or read or hear or watch um, mm-hmm. is kind of giving you uh, uh, the same message, Yes. I guess how do we expect them to think any differently, which is why I think what you do is so amazing because, you know, you may be the first sane voice of reason that some of these <laughs> people have heard, right? And I've talked to um, particularly women under 30. Many have mm. said to me, Paul, I don't even know a guy that doesn't watch porn. No. You know, or I'll say, you know, that you don't have to accept uh porn in your relationship well you can have a, a zero tolerance policy for that and oh, how I, well, who am I going to date I don't know anyone that's right. and that's, I'm that's just shaking right. my head like really that's right yeah that's, a lot of women say that to me as well and tragically they've pretty much they've pretty much given up what we're seeing is here is a sex, sexual stunting of a generation this has not happened before mm-hmm. the fact that Boys can stay up all night viewing porn, hours and hours and hours and cutting themselves off from life-giving activities and, and behaviours. You know, you know that's not, they can't have a healthy sexuality uh, as a result of that. It's, it's diminishing their own humanity. Like if you want to look at it from a self-interested point, you de- you're diminishing your own humanity. I've mm-hmm. interviewed a number of young men who were the chronic porn users from the age of eight or nine. One is now oh. 18 and he has uh, stopped consuming. And he said, I didn't recognize myself anymore. He said, I cut myself off from my family. He had a loving family. He said, I stopped playing sport. He said, I, all I wanted to do was get to my computer. I didn't want to do anything else. He said that his um, school schooling suffered and and he also said that he recognised that he was mentally undressing every girl, every woman in his mind, every girl and woman that he met, and he was disgusted by himself because he, he still had a bit of an ethical core, you know, that wasn't totally destroyed yet. And he said the big thing that stopped him consuming was that he recognised that he had become a patron of a global industry that was engaged in, you know, trafficking women into porn, you know, you can't tell what's, you know, traffic-free porn or consent porn or, you know, real choice. Yeah, you don't even know the ages of the people in the... I know the ages and, you know, we've found underage girls on uh, Pornhub, their videos have been used, girls who were raped and were uh, unconscious or semi-conscious videos on Pornhub. So he recognised he'd become part of this global system uh, that treated women like this and he just uh-huh. didn't want to do, do that anymore. So boys need to be helped to recognise that this is going to harm them as, as human beings and set them up for failure in terms of sustaining intimate long-term partnerships. Uh-huh. What, uh, Melinda, what, what are you uh, hearing from firsthand from the students? Let's say, uh, let, let's say first middle school and then, and then the high school ages. What are the girl? first of all, what are the girls telling you? Like, like what's, what's, walk me through the day to day life of a typical 16 year old yes. high school girl that's, you know, let's say semi popular, yes. semi good looking. 
Well, I'd love to do that because uh, that's really my, my passion is exposing what girls are suffering uh, every day. I'm just digging out a summary here in, in my notes. Uh, girls describe really living in a, a, a sexually intrusive world, a world of sexual mm. intrusion. Um, they talk about every, at school, they just say it's normal, it's common to be sexually harassed at school. Uh, this so, would so be the verbally, experience like grabbed, verbally, or, okay. verbal sexual harassment or on the school bus on the way home. Now, uh, one school that I knew of had had to sexually segregate the school buses because the girls refused to get on the bus to ride home with the boys because the level of harassment was so great, uh, the groping, the unwanted touching, the demands for sexual pictures or having photos taken surreptitiously up their skirts. They just wanted to go home on their own bus. What's the driver doing? Well, a lot of these things can happen, you know, at the back of the bus. I mean, that's, a, that's another question, exactly. But uh, the problem was so bad, I'm not even sure the driver can control it when you've well, got... Well, I, I, I guess the proper answer is the, the driver is driving the bus, right? <laughs> so, yes. so, I mean, yes. you know, it's not their job to, to police the students, but I'm that's just... That's right. Wow. Uh, girls would also tell me about being ranked at school on their bodies compared to the bodies of porn stars. Uh, so girls would be given a, a ranking and then that would be shared by boys on social media. Uh, I have... So, so they uh, say like uh, Lucy, Lucy's a 10 compared yeah. to such and yeah. such a large... She That's right. And then imagine the girls with the lowest rankings, how they would feel, as well as the girls with the highest rankings. I mean, it's, it's degrading and debasing any way you look at it. Right. Uh, they tell me about having their bums grabbed or their breasts touched as they go through crowded corridors every mm -hmm. single day, always rubbing their genitals against them in the corridors, being asked for oral sex by boys during recess or lunch. Uh, they talk about uh, being called a snitch, frigid or a dog if they speak up or complain about any of these things. Uh, even rape jokes being made in front of girls who are known as rape survivors. Uh, messages appearing on social media when you get home saying, quote, your ass looks so good today, or negative or insulting comments about sexual features or threats to rape you. Uh, there's some wow. of the experiences from, from girls. And when I speak to them, they realise that uh, this is sexual harassment it's actually illegal they don't often realize this is illegal a because they've been so are, yeah. used to it it's become so much part of their, their normal days demands for sexual images is a big one and uh, i rarely meet a girl who hasn't been asked to or pressured to send a sexual picture uh boys also sending girls pictures that girls haven't asked for so even really young girls uh say 12 years old, 13 years old, are receiving dick pics on their phones, uh, yeah. which in Australia is also illegal. It's a form of sexual harassment. Again, yeah. a lot of girls don't know that. They think they just need to put up with it. Yeah. Uh, so terrible pressures. How are they supposed to learn? How are they supposed to enjoy their education? How are they supposed to flourish in school? And when this, this isn't like once a month. Normal this environment? Is yeah, this isn't once a month or once a year. This is weekly, daily? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. Wow. Uh, that, that's even worse than I thought, Melinda. I mean, I you know, I follow some of your, you know, stories and on social media and articles and, and yes. so I'm probably more aware than the average person, but uh, that's even beyond. Uh, I summarized uh, a lot of these experiences in a piece for the ABC called Growing Up in Pornland. Girls have had it with porn conditioned boys. And that piece uh, really attracted a lot of a lot of interest because it wasn't well known, you know, how big how big the problem was. So girls often express to me uh, relief that their problems have been named, the pressures they're under have been named. Oh, another big one is wolf whistling, cat calling. Oh, you know, I've had girls tell me they've been cat called, you know, every day of their lives from the age of nine. That's a, that's, a, that's a common experience as well. So the girls will be relieved. Often they will be crying in tears. And the, the best part is seeing them equipped and empowered to say that's it, you know, to draw a line under it. We're not going to put up with this. We're going to confront 
the boys or we're going to tell a trusted adult about about this behaviour, you know, or they'll quietly tell me about uh, their concerns for a friend who's going through the same thing and they want to be able to help uh, their friend. Now, the experience with boys is interesting. I've noticed a, a somewhat of a shift in the last year. Okay. Uh, I would get a lot more aggression and a lot more opposition to my message from boys. But I think more boys now are realising that this is hurting them as well. And I have boys actually confessing crimes to me, which is, you know, this mandatory reporting here. So, yeah. But they'll yeah. say to me, you know, I, I've done those things. I've coerced girls to do things they didn't want to do. I've demanded the pictures. I've groped them. I've, you know, I've taken advantage of women who were drunk. And they're actually wanting to confess this and, and for want of a better word, you know, atone and sort of redeem themselves by getting involved with Collective Shout, by apologising to the girls. I've had some profound experiences where I was addressing a group of Year 11 boys in South Australia and one boy just stood up suddenly and interrupted. And at first I thought, oh, that's a bit rude. What's he doing? He said, I just have to stop you because I want to apologise to every girl in the room today for how I've treated them. Wow. The place just went nuts you know the girls were crying the boys were really moved wow I've had, I've had more boys confront their peers in the classroom so uh peers might be uh, laughing at some of my slides where i'm talking about violence and i i had one young man in tasmania stand up with tears in his eyes and he said how dare you laugh about this you know this is serious wow it wow. happened to someone you love you know how dare you he was yeah. only 16 or 17 and it's boys like that that break out of the pack that break out of the the toxic masculinity conditioning of the culture and of porn and say you know we're not going to be like that even if we get bullied even if we get ostracized even if we get picked on we want to be decent young men we want to be young men of integrity and and we're not going to go along with that anymore so i've been encouraged to see more boys now wanting to work with us, wanting to join our campaigns, wanting to stand up for young women uh, because they recognise that, you know, we're all, in this, we're all in this together and that they can't afford to allow the porn industry to dictate and shape uh, their sexuality. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's almost everything you mentioned is, is from boys directed to girls. Um, is there anything that boys talk about, um, like maybe they get unsolicited pictures from girls or yes. get threatened by girls if they don't do something or... So that's so not that's so that's much, not. Yeah, I don't hear, like, it's not the same kind of violent type expressions that girls tell me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not the girls being aggressive in the same way. However, there have been instances of boys telling me that they have received unsolicited pictures from girls. We have to recognise that girls are products of the culture as well mm -hmm. and are being shaped and moulded and socialised to think that they need to behave like this. Yeah. They've also been given a false message about empowerment, which is if you behave as badly as boys have, then that'll make you equal rather yeah. than us all agreeing. Yeah. This behaviour is wrong. Whoever's doing it, let's get rid of it. Let's abolish it. Yeah. So tragically, girls are living in a culture that rewards exhibitionism. You know, they, right. they see like certain body. Culture, kind of, or? Yeah. So the selfie culture, they're seeing it on Instagram, they're seeing certain bodies that are praised and rewarded, they, mm. they experience terrible levels of body shaming. If they don't fit a norm that usually, you know, corporates and big business and industries have decided should be the norm, right. people that are usually out to make money yeah. by preying on our, especially the angst of adolescent girls, mm -hmm. So girls are, are acting out what they've been taught and socialised as, into, as, into as well. So sometimes they do behave badly to the boys. 
uh, and that needs to be sort of addressed and, and deconstructed as well. Yeah, can you explain uh, what um, revenge porn is and sextortion, what, what, yes. what that means? This is where, for example, a, a guy might pressure a girl to send an image and often underage girls, you know, they're, the brains are still developing. They don't have the cognitive ability to recognize consequences and often everyone around them doing it. And they think, oh, look, maybe he likes me. You know, they think there's more to it than there actually is. They don't always understand that he's no. got a vast collection of, of images from girls and he's just sharing it with his mates. And anyway, so she might send one picture that's a bit suggestive and then he says, send me more or I'm going to tell your family. Or I'm going to tell everyone at school. Uh, and that causes her to panic and uh, tragically often will send more. And it's not just in adolescent relationships. It happens in uh, adult relationships. Well, you can't even call it a relationship, really. It happens between adults yeah. as well. So that's the sextortion piece. Yeah, and, and also, of course, strangers doing it, predators on Instagram. We have a huge campaign called Wake Up Instagram, a mm. global campaign. And that's it. we've uh, exposed hundreds and hundreds of predators on Instagram trying wow. to post sexualized comments, comment, trying to contact the girls uh, privately, uh, saying what they want to do to the girls and and requesting requesting images mm. and so if a, if a vulnerable girl sends one of those predators that she doesn't recognize as a predator uh, an image because often they masquerade as 16 year old boys and they're 60 year old men you know so she may send one picture uh, then he demands more or threatens to publish that picture to post it to tell everyone she knows to tell all her friends okay and uh, he can use that um, uh, revenge porn also includes revenge porn is slightly different in that that revenge porn can involve intimate relationships that were ongoing and where he the relationship ends and he's the partner is wanting to get back at her uh, so he shares her he shares her images which she did not consent consent to. So she, she may have consented because it was a trusted, intimate relationship, mm -hmm. uh, but then he punishes her by sharing her images publicly. I heard a story from, a, it was a client actually who was, uh, I think, about 16, and uh, this happened in his high school. So um, um, this girl broke up with her boyfriend, and mm -hmm. uh, he had some pictures of her, mm -hmm. um, nude or, or semi-nude. So he, um, he air, it's called an airdrop. So if you have a, an iPhone yeah. and, and you're, um, you're near me like 20 feet away and I, hit, yeah. I, I, pick, I select a photo and I hit airdrop and it goes to everybody within 20 feet of me. Yes. I, I know. He, he told me that. I'm like, I was like, what? What? Yeah. It? You know, really? He's like, yeah. oh yeah, and he doesn't even seem phased. Just like, yeah, this is just another day at school. That's and right. I'm thinking, what what if what if she gets shamed and bullied oh, and she will. Those people end up committing suicide? They do. Girls have ended up taking their lives when they realize those images are out there forever. Yeah. And that those images get end up on porn sites has been documented by Internet Watch Foundation. Uh, girls aren't thinking this. They're not thinking this is where my image uh, could end up if yeah. I share it. But then, of course, uh, with revenge porn, it's shared anyway, even when they're, it may have originally been taken consensually. So it's just not safe to share I images. That's kind of my bottom line, and it may sound extreme, but I've talked to too many women and girls whose I images agree. have ended up in places that they never considered. They never thought this would happen to them. It's yeah. affected their education. It's affected their ability to get a job. Uh, and those pictures circulate forever. You can't get rid of them. There's no 1-800 number to ring to get your, your pictures down. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I tell, I, I don't even think couple, like married couples should be sending naked pictures of themselves to each other because you don't know if you, you send a picture of yourself and 
your, your, your husband's buddy grabs the phone when it comes through and he grabs it and he does a screenshot and sends it to himself and he thinks it's a big joke. And next thing you know, you're on okay. the internet. Or the phone gets stolen or this lost. Is not smart. Or what you know, yeah. hacking is a huge problem. We've seen celebrities, intimate pictures get hacked uh, from, from the cloud. You know, we can't be so naive to think this yeah. won't happen yeah. in our own lives. Melinda, is there anything, um, it, it, you've been doing this quite a, quite a long time now, uh, is mm -hmm. there anything that shocks or surprises you uh, or have you become unshockable? You know, because I always tell my clients, listen, yeah. I'm, I, you're not going to shock me, so just, you know, tell me what's going on. And um, yeah, but every once in a while I kind of go, hmm, okay, yeah. really? Yeah. I think... Um the age at which the harms are being enacted uh, becoming younger, I still find that distressing. When I'm in a, a primary school, I've got all these little kids in a room and then in question time, they'll ask, what do I do about the boys that are touching me in the wrong place at school? Or, you know, girls disclosing sexual acts being done, done to them and they're, and they're young when you've got little girls showing you on their phones the dick pics they've had that day at school that ask me for example uh if he stalks me does that mean he really likes me because they've all seen 50 shades of gray at 12 or 13. so we've taught them that stalking is an act of romance what a disaster that is that they what think a that's disaster. Yeah. it's like an act of passion you oh. know so again warping their ideas of relationships their bodies sexuality what they're good for that still troubles me i remember a, a teenage girl said that a boy said to her if you give me oral sex i'll give you a kiss so they're paying for these tokens of romance with sexual acts that often have been learned from pornography I had a 15-year-old girl say to me, on a Friday night, I really like to watch a boyfriend with my, a movie with my boyfriend, uh, but I, we get se I get sex out of the way early, otherwise he'll be harassing me all through, through the movie and I just want to settle down and watch the film. So we have sex first, so then he'll, you know, he'll watch the film with me. Right. So this is the, you know, the new dating experience of, of so many girls and the expectations on them uh, does disturb me and as we started off earlier thinking that it's a radical to say no like this is like this radical revelation I'm allowed to say no and not be punished for it not feel bad about it how did it come to this that, that would be seen as a as a radical action a radical countercultural action right to take that tells us a lot doesn't it it does and it kind of leads me to my next question what, what do you think um Teachers, parents, mental health, uh, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's too big of a question. Let, let's say, well, let, let's say, let, let's start with teachers and then we'll talk about parents and mental health professionals uh, yes. as much as you're able to speak to that. But I, I, yes. imagine, I imagine teachers are, are kind of in this, because like, I'm trying to picture myself, okay, I'm, 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 let's say I'm a teacher and I'm listening to you, okay, and I'm thinking, yes. well, I'm not the kid's parent. What if this happens outside school grounds yes. or, or uh, you know, um, they, 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 they send and receive these pictures on the weekend and then they bring them to school and, you know, I'm yes. just trying to get through the day and teach my class here. I'm not here. That's right. I really feel for teachers. I really feel for teachers. They're confronting issues in the educational setting that even five or ten years ago teachers weren't having to confront to this degree so what we need paul is a whole of community approach teachers can't do it on their own parents can't do it on their own caregivers mental health professionals this has to be a whole of community agreement otherwise we won't succeed so with teachers i'll, I'll show them the research the academic literature to show them there's a solid evidence base for uh, for recognizing the harms and then acting on it. So I'll start with the research 
Uh, then I'll talk about the duty of care that schools have to create a safe educational environment. If boys are accessing porn at school and then hassling girls, that is a denial of duty of care. That's a failure of duty of care. Uh -huh. So there needs to be a porn-free zone at school. Preferably no phones. That's harder to achieve. We've had two states here in Australia uh, ban phones in schools, and it's changed the ability of the kids and their behaviour, their focus, their concentration, their less idea. stress, they're less anxious. Yeah. So some of our mental health professionals here that uh, I work with have helped to, to push that, uh, particularly in primary schools. Uh, kids don't need internet-enabled devices in primary school. So no. really you're giving them a hand grenade. Right. Uh, and then having the support of the school to address it. What's, you know, the school needs to have strong policies here. Is it, is it one strike and you're out? Is it three strikes and you're out? You know, often boys are looking at porn on their laptops in the classroom. They'll sit at the back and they'll have... And here's the other thing that schools need to be aware of. They may have every filtering device known to humankind. They may have filtering on the, in the library, on the computers. What kids are doing, certainly here in Australia, is putting all the porn on a USB stick and wow. putting the stick into the laptop. Yeah. Even in the classroom. Right. So that schools need to be vigilant about this. And anyone consuming porn at school needs to know that this is unacceptable. This is not what we do at school. Right. Uh, images are being shared around at school. That that's also needs to be zero tolerance on, on that. So the schools have got to be firm about it. You know, this is a public health crisis we're talking about here. Yeah. And we can't go softly, softly. We can't. Well, we, don't, we don't hand out cigarettes at the door to 16-year-olds and then give them a light in class, do we? Tell them it's their choice, exactly. Yeah. So uh, given the societal impacts, given the impacts especially on our vulnerable young people and their developing sexual templates, uh, schools have to take a really strong line on this. And for parents, uh, if the school isn't, you might want to look at another school. Because yeah. your, kids, your kids are going to be harmed if the school isn't on board with this. Yeah. Uh, do you find, uh, Melinda, in, in Australia there, um, and, and I don't know how many psychologists and, and therapists you, you interact with, but do you find they're generally very knowledgeable about this? Because in Canada, I don't find that um, mm. we, we are as much as other places. Look, it's variable, you know, because I've had women tell me that they've gone to see a psychologist with their porn-consuming partner, and the psychologist has told her, it's your fault, you've got to relax, this is what men do. Oh. Try, try drinking alcohol before sex. Get that monkey off your back that tells you there's something wrong with this. So, unfortunately, the woman has been blamed because she doesn't oh, want to go along with... traumatised, actually. And traumatised. Yeah. Re-traumatised. Uh, yeah. Re-traumatised, exactly, yeah. by psychologists and counsellors who reinforce uh, the male's behaviour and ignore her trauma, yeah. her grief, her feeling that she's being cheated on. Mm -hmm. uh, her her feelings of total inadequacy, yeah, and harms to the family, harms to the children. Sometimes there's consumption in front of the children, or the boys are being introduced mm -hmm. upon by a, by a father. So, having said that, there are other psychologists who do recognise this is harmful, and uh, will will help uh, the couple to work through that and help affirm the woman for how the partner for how she feels she feels about it but there's very few that i would refer to that i would be confident in that would you know share my views my to, approach to this you have issue to check them out sort of and be careful about exactly it. yeah yes. um sorry go ahead fortunately we have had the australian medical association in australia the former president speak out against pornography and the harms oh. of porn, especially to young people. So that was really helpful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've also had some good research uh, about sexualization of children uh, come out of the uh, Australian Psychological Association, the American Psychological Association, of course. Yeah. I think we are seeing a bit of a shift because when I first started out full-time on this issue a decade ago, 
there wasn't a lot of recognition of the harms of porn, uh, right. even the harms of sexualizing children. But now we're not criticized as much for our views because the research now is so solid, the global evidence is so solid on this. And, and also schools and parents are seeing the impacts, like it's undeniable now. Mm -hmm. When you're seeing a rise of child-on-child -child sexual assault at rates never before seen, uh, predator, copycat behaviour, children mm -hmm. acting out on other children, what they've seen, what they've been exposed to, yeah. you, know, you, can't, you can't deny that. And again, the kids haven't thought of this themselves. Yeah. You know, they've learned this, they've been taught this, and now they're acting it out on other children. And this is where we have to draw the links uh, between porn and porn culture and violence against women because, as I've already said, attitudes shape behaviour. And yeah. if you educate uh, primarily boys that women exist for your sexual gratification and pleasure and you should be able to do whatever you want to them, of course we're going to see more, more violence more coercive control, more domination, more sexual harassment. We've, we've allowed the development of the culture which fuels sexual harassment, which makes sexual harassment inevitable. Like none of this is a mystery to me. This is a... a, 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 a logical outcome. And a logical outcome is the exact phrase I was looking for, a logical outcome to the embedding of porn norms in, in the culture at every level. Right. Uh, do you feel a um, uh, couple, okay, so a couple of phrases and, and just your reaction. And I came across this at the Nicosi conference. Uh, good talk, by the way. Oh, and I want you to just share oh, real okay. briefly about the whole child sex doll thing and, and then before, yes. we, before we wrap up, but uh, culture of secrecy, culture of denial. Yes. And the thing is, the thing is, you know, and, and you know, I, I speak a little bit, nothing near what you do, but I've been to schools, I, I've spoken at mm. conferences and, and different, you know, workshops and stuff, and it's mm. sort of like... Um, I, I, okay, so let's say I speak to a group of 100 people. Probably mm. half of them watch porn. Mm. You know, and, and maybe yeah, not problematically is. or in a, in a, mm. in a maybe they, they don't meet the criteria for a, a compulsion, okay? Yes. But they do. Maybe they've yeah. watched some very degrading and uh, abusive and violent porn. Um, or, or they see nothing wrong with it. And, and there's a whole branch in, in, the, in mental health, like called sex, sexologists, I guess. And mm -hmm. it, they're like anything goes kind of thing, you know. So, so I, I think when, when we, we speak up, the, it, isn't it in, like it's such an interesting topic, you know. And I always wonder, and I, and I always preface my comments like, you know, this isn't a moral, religious, judgmental thing. I'm not here to tell you what to do with your you know, your sexuality or what's wrong or right, but it's sort of, this, this is what's happening in the world and this is the evidence, right? But yeah. I think it triggers and shames people and is, is, there, is there a long-standing cultural undercurrent of sexual shame that we're dealing with underneath all of this? I don't know if I said, do you, do you, do you kind of get what I'm trying to say? Look, I, I do and I have... I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, conflicted on the shame thing because okay. I, I do agree that if we take a shame-based approach, uh, boys will end up not talking about it, not getting the help they need, not making themselves accountable and ending up in worse places. However, I still think there's a role for shame mm. because I think... You know, there should be shame. If you're getting off on depictions of women who are being degraded, who are being spat at, who are being choked, who are being, you know, multiply gang-banged, no, uh, you know, if you get off on here. some of the genres that I've had to expose myself to, like the Nazi and Holocaust genres of porn, of women being violated in depictions of concentration camps, right? I reckon there should be some shame around that. You know, yourself. Yeah. I know it's yeah. not a popular view. Yeah, yeah. But 
isn't there a role, can't there be a role for shame in terms of prompting or reawakening the conscience, uh-huh. you know, which may have been dulled as a result of ongoing long-term consumption? If there's still a little bit of shame, maybe that means there's still something to work with uh-huh. that it hasn't been totally knocked out. Uh-huh. So, you know, I'm kind of having a little bit both ways here. I don't think we can take an entirely shame-based approach or the kids won't talk to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, whoever's struggling won't. However, <laughs> there should be some shame. If, if you're masturbating to images of extreme torture, cruelty, mm-hmm. degradation, rape porn, Ooh. sadism porn, if you're yeah. getting off on incest-themed porn, yeah. yes, I think there's a place for shame here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a part of me and, uh, you know, as a, I'm a per- fairly compassionate therapist, there's a part of me that says, wants to slop him and say, what the hell's wrong with you? Yeah. I'm sure you've had that urge many times. <laughs> right. Uh, I probably wouldn't confess to it, but, um, yeah. Okay. No, sorry. Well, I'd I probably look, more, I'd try to be, right? yeah, no, look, I, I try to, I try to reserve my anger for the industry, which is praying. Mm-hmm on our young men from the earliest of ages, from children, yes. you know? Yeah. Uh, that's where my, my, my anger lies and the deformation yeah. of authentic intimacy, sensuality, relationships, ethics, you know, ethics in sexuality, all of those things mm-hmm. uh, draw, draw my anger and fuel, fuel what I do. Yeah. So do you feel uh, a couple more will wrap up and, and I want to hear about the, um, the Alibaba, uh, the, mm. the Alibaba incident, let's call it. And it'd be good to add on it. It would be good to end on a victory. We want, to, sure. end on, we want to end on that. But uh, do you <laughs> yeah. feel um, you're making a difference? I, I, I'm pretty sure you're going to say yes, but do you feel like you're, despite everything you do, it's like bailing out the Titanic with a, a sand pail? Have we lost this generation? I can't afford to think that or I couldn't get out of bed in the morning, Paul. Right, I couldn't yes. spend up at all these schools. I couldn't spend hours doing the research and putting the talks together and uh, reviewing the evidence base. I couldn't, I just couldn't show up if I believed it, it was a lost cause. You know, having yeah. said that, believe me, I do have my dark days. Yeah. Uh, I do. But I have a great team around me. I debrief every day and I do see signs of hope, especially in my interactions with young people and what they tell me. Uh, and we do have victories. So Collective Shout, we're, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary now. We're 10 years old. Awesome. And it's really me and a small team. You know, it's really yeah, me and a small four, team. Yeah, right? Or five of you? Yeah, four at the moment. Yeah. One's on maternity leave. Okay. And, you know, we, we take it up to global corporations. We call it out. You know, our American... Our North American friends say they love us because uh, they'll play the good cop and we'll always play the bad cop. You know, we'll name the names. We'll, we'll tag the CEOs. We'll plaster their photos on Twitter. And we did this with Alibaba. Yeah, tell so us the found, Alibaba. Insane. Yeah, well, we found large numbers of replicate children, child uh, sex dolls, infants, babies, lifelike babies, right. for God's sake. Uh, you know, Wait, these are dolls, and these aren't dolls, these are dolls designed to sexually act out on. Well, they are advertised as having three holes for your enjoyment, oh. right? So it's pretty clear like, this isn't something that you know we're taking a punt on, we're taking a guess at. Yeah, and uh, these sex dolls were being uh, marketed and sold through 23 sellers using uh, the Alibaba platform. And so we called, we called it out. We said, how can the corporate, this, in the top 10 most wealthy corporates in the world, profit from eroticizing and fetishizing child sexual abuse, yeah. even toddlers, even babies? Uh-huh. Because we showed an interest as part of our research, we were being sent videos of, of naked babies uh, to model, modeling the dolls, the naked baby dolls. And that's content I wish I actually wish I hadn't seen. Yeah. It took me; it's taken me a while to recover from that. And uh, so we called out Alibaba, and it was a two-week campaign. And Alibaba has removed those dolls, 
and is tightening up its policies and procedures, its due diligence, its compliance to try to stop this happening again. And that was because people supported us. Like this campaign really took off globally. We had massive media in multiple yeah. languages. It's we had not that hard massive... to get behind removing child sex abuse dolls. Like you this know, one really, really resonated. You're going to get a lot of pushback from people on that, right? Well, some still say, some still justified it, but uh, yeah. oh, the course. majority seem to be with us. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a great ago, win so just you, last week. So you directly approached the executives, and within two weeks, they had discontinued the sale of this doll. And was there yeah. was there an explanation like it, it just sorry it slipped through the cracks? Like we can't. That's what they said, but we didn't accept that because this is actually the third time it's happened. They were called out in 2018 and in January of this year. I did not know that. I did not know that. Okay. Yes. And then we came in. <laughs> right. The third okay. time. Brought in the heavy hitters. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So. Uh, All right. We tried. We went in very get hard. We went in very show, hard. Get collective shout on the phone. Yeah. It's time to pull up. That's the it. That's right. So, yeah, we took it up to the the um, heads of the company, and also there's a representative in Australia, New Zealand. Uh, who is quite well known because she's the daughter of a former prime minister okay. and she's uh, Alibaba's lifestyle representative for Australia New Zealand so we got on to her and that's when we really saw saw a shift with that campaign so a lot of our work is grassroots activism and campaigning as well as higher end advocacy lobbying submissions to government and you know we've built this grassroots movement over a 10 year a period calling for social change, cultural transformation, sexualization, objectification, porn, porn culture, trafficking, violence against women, all these things are interlinked. Uh -huh. And that's been something we've really pushed is the interlinkages. You can't address one on its own. They all feed and fuel each other. Yeah. And again, that the book, Big Porn, brilliantly uh, shows that through through the research and the, the academic evidence is really indisputable about how it really is yes. all all connected. So um, a real yes. eye opener I recommend again for everyone to get that. Uh, uh, I think we'll wrap up Melinda. One one last question. Um, uh, you know what, what's a challenge I, and I, I gave you I gave you an hour to think about this, you know, because I warned yes. you at the beginning. But mm -hmm. um, a challenge or um, I, I don't know if advice is a, no, let's go with challenge. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of people watching this are um, frontline workers and what would be something they can do to help tackle this issue? Well, again, it's great. You've even got this workshop happening at such a significant event. I think to be aware, to be informed, to be across the research or at least summaries of the research so you can be confident to know that uh, this is harmful to health and well-being, psychological, mental health, physical health, emotional health, spiritual health. You know, just get across the research and uh, address it in, in your clinical, cl clinical practices and don't allow uh, the consumer to to make excuses for his behavior, his mistreatment of a partner. Don't play down a partner's concerns, how she feels. I'm sorry, I, I'm primarily saying she, that's mostly been my experience. Oh, that's usually, that's usually how yeah. it is. And don't, don't minimize uh, her concerns, you know, affirm, affirm her for how she feels about this. And, mm. you know, I actually think women need to be encouraged to end the relationship. And I know that's not an easy thing to do. But if he's refusing to change, I mean, I talk to women who have endured this for 10 years, 20 years, it's destroyed her, it's destroyed the children, and he's still insisting on using that it's not a problem. You know, yeah. I think there's a time to encourage her to get out of that, yeah. to get out of that relationship. You know, yeah. why, why should she be sacrificed to save the marriage? And what mm -hmm. does that marriage look like anyway? What are you actually saving? Yes. Uh, so yep. they're just a few things that I would suggest. And, of course, your own self-care as well when you're hearing these stories. They can be very traumatic. Yeah. 
So looking after yourself as well to state the obvious. Good. Yes. Thank. Thanks for that. Um, those suggestions and that insight. So we'll wrap it up here. Mm. And uh, thank you again so much for taking your your time to share with me. And and uh, you know when when I um, when I talk and share and speak and do my trainings, it's it's like I can take you with me now. And and so I'm really I'm oh, really yeah, that's right. And uh, share your expertise uh, with the world because I think it's yeah. hard fought and hard won and very valuable. And thank you. more people need to hear uh, this message. So. Thanks Thank again, you. Melinda. Yeah, and Thank you for the opportunity to reach so, so many Canadian psychologists and, and others that you work with. It's a, a great opportunity for me as well. Thank you so much. Okay, all the best, and uh, you take care. Stay in touch. Thanks, Paul. You too.